In a world of big, crazy $1,000 plus phones, the S24 might just be my favorite this year. It gets all the fun new AI features like the Ultra, the ultra bright screen, and the same processor. On paper, it smashes its competition, but of course, it's not perfect. And after using it for a month, here's everything about the S24 and why I think it's one of the best. The design is simple, but I think it's a slap phone perfected. And this is the wrong phone. With the S24, with the S24, it's like the designer is challenged to design the phone with as few strokes as possible. They even made the speaker grill one slit as opposed to many small holes. And I kind of like it. It's got an elegance to the simplicity. The edges are also more flat as opposed to the more rounded design on the S23. The only problem is that the best looking color is this green and you can't even get it in the stores. The back glass is matte and it feels really nice but this is kind of how all phones are now. The hardware on the S24 is pretty insane, especially for the price. For being not an ultra, it still basically has all the top of the line features, maybe except for the cameras. It has a 120 Hz screen that's 1080p on the small one and actually 2K on the plus model, which is pretty awesome. But this year, it also matches the crazy 2600 nits brightness of the ultra. And it is very bright very much sufficient for outdoor and comparing to the 2000 nits on the iPhone 15, you can definitely notice that it's a bit brighter, but it's not a huge difference. The S24 Ultra still technically has a slightly better display with the only difference being the glass. The Ultra gets the Gorilla Armor glass and it's supposed to be tougher, but it also has a better anti-reflection coating. The anti-reflection coating is pretty noticeable and I do miss it here, but the Gorilla Glass Victus 2 on the S24 is still very strong and on par with anything else out there. The most improved part about the hardware this year is definitely the processor. It's crazy fast and efficient. I'll show you the tests later, but right now I want to talk about the cameras because it's surprisingly better for being basically the same thing as last year. But before I show you the photo comparison of the S24 against the Ultra and the iPhone 15, I'm going to brush my teeth with today's sponsor. This is the most tech packed toothbrush I've ever seen. The Life & Wave electric toothbrush from just the packaging feels very different. It's like I'm unboxing a phone. Inside you get the toothbrush, of course, and underneath three toothbrush heads. The gray one is for daily brushing, the blue one is for higher efficiency cleaning, and the purple one helps with whitening. The Life & Wave also comes with a nice braided cable that snaps onto the bottom of the toothbrush for magnetic fast charging. I really like this toothbrush design. The handle is made out of ABS plastic and there aren't any crevices, which really helps to keep it clean both aesthetically and physically. It also has an IPX7 waterproof rating, so it's easy to clean and it won't get damaged by water. But the most unique thing about this toothbrush is that it has a pro proprietary servo system that allows for 60 degrees oscillation. And this aligns with what dentists recommend for brushing technique, where it goes up and down your teeth. And combined with the vibration, this toothbrush just makes it a lot faster to clean your teeth. Also, the bristles are made to be softer and tapered to be more gentle on your gums. And it's genuinely the best toothbrush I've ever used. The handle feels nice and it's almost like doing the brushing for me. The Life & Wave itself is very simple, it just has one pressure sensitive button on the handle but you can actually customize it a lot with the Life & App, like how much vibration and oscillation you want. You can save three different modes and also set a brushing time duration. But probably the most quirky thing is the flight mode. It's not for using it on airplanes, but it just prevents accidental touches. You can check out the Life & Wave toothbrush at the link in my description and get 10% off. My biggest complaint about phone cameras has never been it doesn't have enough megapixels or any of that it's always been the processing. The processing does a lot of good things, giving these tiny phone cameras good dynamic range and color, but typically it's always bundled with way too much denoising and sharpening. There have been some workarounds with Samsung to get a more natural looking photo, such as taking them in the 50 megapixel mode or using the app camera assistant and then enabling the picture softening. But this year, the default 12 megapixel mode processing actually looks very nice. I took a bunch of photos in many different locations and now for the main camera next to the iPhone 15, it has noticeably less sharpening, which you can really see in the tree leaves here. And I think it looks more natural. But in this indoor light shot, the iPhone 15 does capture a bit more detail. You can see it in the back wall. It looks way less mushy, but the S24 looks identical to the S24 Ultra, so it's not bad. In this other shot, all three look pretty similar, and in terms of the dynamic range, I would say it's pretty comparable too. The fire doesn't look crazy blown out. Another place where you can really see the reduced sharpening is in the videos. Next to the iPhone 15, the S24 video has less of that typical sharpened smartphone video look. 
But one area where it loses out is that the iPhone now defaults to shooting a higher res picture at 24 megapixels. And I think that's a good idea. As you can see, aside from the sharpening, there is a bit more detail in the rocks here. So Samsung maybe next year, but the S24 still has a much more complete set of cameras, given that it actually has a telephoto camera. The quality is only decent at 10 megapixels, but it definitely beats not having one. And as for the ultra wide, it just looks pretty mid, but so is it on most other phones. And one of the bigger benefits is One UI. Over the years, there's been lots of fun features added to it, and they actually make quite a big difference in my daily use. And it's not just the new AI stuff. The one new feature that you don't even have to use to benefit from is the vividness slider. Before, you could change how vivid and saturated the colors looked on a Samsung phone, but there was only two settings, the natural, which honestly looks kind of dull, and the vivid, which is pretty crazy colorful. But now you can change just how vivid the screen is with this vividness slider, and it's actually defaulted to the least aggressive settings, which is less vivid than before. And I think it's a sweet spot. And another thing that I like is the new always on display style. It's a dim version of the lock screen wallpaper and the time and lock screen widgets pop out from it. This style isn't new in the smartphone world. It's pretty much exactly like how the iPhone does their AOD. And I do like this new style over the old one. When this phone is just laying on the table, I have an easier time seeing the time. And the dim wallpaper just looks cuter and more aesthetic. And actually, the lock screen has quietly had some pretty significant and nice updates. So first of all, you can now add lock screen widgets. And I really like these. I think it's very convenient to see things like my weather information, battery information, just at a glance directly on the lock screen. The only thing is they don't seem to be interactive. I think it'd be really nice if, for example, I can check off my to-do list directly from the lock screen. Also, now if you use a wallpaper with a subject in it, you can apply all sorts of effects to make the subject stand out more. There's the simple blur, but there's also this really sick looking pastel painting effect and this ink effect. It looks like I'm popping out of a drawing, but actually that's not all. There's also these frames that you can apply. Whoa, and the subject actually sticks out of them. This is honestly very creative. I love it. And moving on to the home screen, hidden inside of the widgets, there's a new custom camera shortcut. You can set the starting mode like portrait, video, panorama, and you can also choose a custom photo to be the display image. So it's kind of like a photo displayer and camera shortcut two in one. The only thing is, I wish it would also let me shortcut to the ultra wide or telephoto because right now the only two options are front and rear. There's also been a major change with QuickShare. Now it has replaced nearby share for Android. And in my previous testing, it worked works very well with Windows computers, and it's actually quicker than AirDrop by quite a bit. But probably the best thing is that it can generate a QR code. So even if your friend has an iPhone and there won't be like a QuickShare app on the App Store, they can just scan the QR code and be able to download the files. This process is very quick and convenient too. But yeah, I really like how it's opened up a lot more now. QuickShare is much more open than AirDrop and it works great. But in addition to these new One UI features, there's also all of these new AI features. The S24 Ultra seems to be the phone most associated with those, but they're actually not exclusive to it at all. You have all of the same AI features on the S24 and later starting in late March, the S23 series, the Z Fold, Z Flip, and even the Tab S9s will all get them too. I have extensively tested out the AI features and I definitely don't use all of them in my daily life, but there are some that are very useful. And the most useful one for me has to be circle to search. Now, whenever I see something cute online, I just press down, search it to try to find out what it is. And the success rate has actually been pretty high. So it's been very helpful. I also really like the auto format feature in Samsung Notes. I mostly use Samsung Notes just to write down things whenever I think of anything. So they're usually very messy. There's no formatting at all. I don't really need them to be formatted, but I mean, this looks really nice, so I appreciate it. Also, now it's super easy to make a segment of a video slow-mo. You literally just hold down on it. And so I've just been enjoying playing around with my videos. It's pretty cool making them go between slow-mo and normal speed. And there were also some features that I expected to use and like, but ended up not really using that much. And the first one is generative edit. So with this, you should be able to remove things that you don't want and also just move other things in the photo. Basically, this feature lets you use AI to make very significant edits to a photo. It is really cool, but I found that the results are pretty inconsistent. It really depends on what exactly you're trying to do and also the photo itself. But another problem is that it can be pretty slow because it needs to send all the information to a server to process. 
And because it's using a server, you also can't use it offline. So when you're outside and on data, it will consume the data and it can be even slower. And the other one is the writing AI assistant that's built right into the Samsung keyboard. It's very convenient, but it's just not that useful because it's very limited. You can only have it change the tone to be more professional or casual or just put emojis everywhere. Compared to ChatGPT, it just doesn't feel as intelligent. With ChatGPT, you can prompt it to do exactly what you want, like make it professional, but still lighthearted sounding. And once you get something back, you can have it revised further too. So it just ends up being a lot more actually useful. If you want to learn more about all of the AI features and see what they can do, you can watch my last video. And lastly, the new processor. It's a Snapdragon 8 Gen 3. It had a pretty significant speed upgrade over last gen and completely destroys the similarly priced iPhone 15. The GPU is actually even faster than the iPhone 15 Pro Max, and that's pretty crazy. But smaller phones typically aren't that great for gaming because they overheat and the performance drops much faster than the bigger phones. But this year, all of the S24s got a bigger vapor chamber cooler, and perhaps the new processor is also just putting out less heat. In the end, the S24 is almost identical in terms of thermals when compared to the big boy, which means you can expect smooth gaming for just as long even on the smallest S24. This level of performance on a small phone is pretty rare. Just look at the iPhone 15. The performance just kind of falls off a cliff after one minute. Okay, this type of performance is only relevant in pretty intense games but the efficiency can definitely be appreciated in daily use. The S24 actually has a slightly bigger battery this year. I put it up against the iPhone 15 in a battery test, and after eight hours of just playing a 1080p live stream at around 80% brightness, it's 3% ahead of the iPhone 15. And after 10 hours and 10 minutes, it has 10% more battery than the iPhone. I started some gaming benchmarks afterwards. At 11 hours, the iPhone is at 2%, while the S24 still has 11%. And in the end, the Samsung lasted 16 extra minutes running gaming benchmarks, which is pretty significant since that would have easily been like one more hour of video watching. I think the S24 represents a nice combination of hardware and software, and it's pretty underrated since it's not the flagship. It's fast, longer lasting than ever, with a beautiful display as well. The only disappointment being the cameras aren't new or that special, but they're still pretty good. I think it sets the benchmark for a phone of this price range. So yeah, overall, it's pretty awesome. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to subscribe. Also go check out my Instagram and TikTok. They're fun, I promise. <laughs>